All right, thanks everyone for joining the Agile Austin Agile at Scale Special Interest Group. Um, just to go through some quick slides here and then we'll hand it over to Peter. Um, so Agile Austin, right, is a 501c6. It's a nonprofit that's mission is to promote agile software development through exchange of ideas and provide opportunities for professional growth of our members. So what we're here for today is getting that professional growth and learning something about Scrum at scale today. Um, so of course the purpose of the SIG is completely professional growth um, and exchanging ideas. And um, we've got Peter today gonna talk more about Scrum at scale, be more interactive. So we want, we want this to be a more interactive session. Um, so I'm Leland Newsom. Ben is also on with us. Ben and I run this SIG and um, you can connect with us. So we've got both of our LinkedIn in there. I also have an Agile Austin email address there. Feel free to contact me, especially if you, yeah, want to do, or if you have topics. So in other words, you can see that my boys were in here the other day. We want to uh, make sure people are muted. Uh, so we've got some background noise. Um, so if you're not speaking, please. Um, so we, we meet the third Friday of every month from 12 to one o'clock central time. Um, we have uh, Peter joining us from, from Berlin. So he's, it's a little later his time, but um, he was still um, very eager to come join us. Uh, I do want to thank our sponsors. So we'll provide tools like Zoom so we can all use it. Um, and, sorry, there was still more background noise. We have some gold sponsors as well. So, um, and silver and bronze sponsors. So just want to kind of meet those, mention those. So also we have, you know, just the upcoming events. You can find those on, on Meetup. Uh, I, I tend to post a few months earlier. Um, so there's a, usually a couple of them out there. So we have our November one, which Greg will, will join us about outcome-based plans. Um, and then in January, we don't do one in December because it's the Friday right before Christmas and it's usually, I'm usually not available either. So it's, it's, um, it's not a good time to have one. So uh, we skip, we go out to January and in January we have Jenny. Um, she has a talk about comparing agile scaling frameworks, but it's usually about a two hour one. So. She, um, she's cutting it down to also cover less and nexus and other common scaling considerations. So um, since those two are not talked about very often, thought it would be good to get an overview of at least those two as well and some other common scaling considerations. And then finally, if you have any topics you're interested in or if you would like to present on a topic, feel free to reach out to me. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. I mentioned Peter's coming to us from Berlin. So Peter helped teach the, uh, the Cal class, the third class that I was in um, earlier this year. And so that's, so I reached out to him about joining us and he was more than willing to help and uh, great storyteller here that we have, you know, to present for us. So with Peter, I'm going to stop sharing and, and turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I'm pretty happy. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that I can um, um, clarify some maybe Scrum at scale uh, misconce misconceptions and can show you a way um, how to easily scale Scrum. But first of all, is, is maybe I would like to know something. Or maybe uh, who's from Austin here, by the way? Uh, Maybe you should type something in the, in the chat because uh, uh, yeah, I see some some hands raising. And if your if your camera is not on, maybe yeah. Oh yes, yes. Lift your uh, lift your thumb if you're from Austin in the in the feature in the Zoom feature. That's that's really awesome because last year I had a talk in Austin at the at the Global Scrum Gathering in April. I guess that was it. so. Yep. I, I've been there. Nice city, awesome. uh, isn't it? Uh, aren't you called the weird city or something like that? Yes. Yep. Keep Austin weird. Keep Austin weird. Yes. Yes. So, uh, let me share my screen first. I hope it's working well.
So everybody sh should see my screen now, uh, saying yep, Scrum is great, incrementally it. crafting the right organization. So because what I want to talk about is um, that first, if, if you leave uh, the session, that you leave with the impression that Scrum at scale can be a way how you can, how you can scale. Um, and in, in an easy fashion and how you can uh, um, do some organizational development with Scrum at Scale. So Scrum at Scale is not a, a scaling framework like SAFE, LESS, or Nexus. Um, Scrum at Scale is more or less a meta framework. And with this meta framework, you can find your own scaling framework. So that's the main idea of Scrum at Scale. So that's me. I'm, I'm Peter, Peter Fischbach. I'm based in Germany. I, I've done a lot of trainings with, uh, with Jeff Sutherland, co-creator of Scrum, apparently. Uh, we are hosting a community conference in Germany. It's called the Scrum Day. Um, uh, here you see us uh, doing a, uh, a show at the Scrum Day. So it's a conference with maybe 500 people. We're talking about Scrum and uh, the questions about Scrum and good practices. Um, 2018, um, Jeff uh, started uh, a uh, certification program, uh, the Certified Scrum and Scale Practitioner, because we asked him a lot if, if, he, if he could do a little bit more about Scrum and Scale. I worked in, in Germany for a huge railway company with more than 200,000 employees. Uh, we did a lot of Scrum trainings over there and, and you know, if you, are, if you are working in a bigger corporation and think about how Scrum is really working there, people get nervous. And whenever we showed the picture of the Scrum at Scale framework uh, before 2018, people calmed down and said, okay, okay, now with that, it, it might work. And that's why we thought, okay, we, need, we really need to push it because it might be a lightweight approach of scaling and how people can work together. So this is about me. Um, I'm, I'm a Scrum coach. Uh, I train a lot. I, I help companies, so I, I don't want to. Um, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm a Scrum and Scale trainer. I'm I'm a Scrum Inc. trainer, so I'm working with the company of 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 Jeff, and and that's uh, I think that's uh, yeah. I'm I'm based in I'm based in Berlin, so that's that's maybe the most interesting stuff about me. I would like a little bit to know uh, about you. And, and first of all, maybe if you can use the chat and tell me something about your role and how much years of experience do you have with Scrum? So maybe that I can adjust my talk a little bit. So go to the chat, type in your role and your uh, same role, your years of experience with Scrum. Wow, 15 years, three to five years, ten, agile trainer, seven years, two years as a scrum master, enterprise coach, roughly five years, 12 years. Hey, maybe you will, you teach me something about scrum here. <laughs> eight years plus priority manager, eight years. Awesome, scrum masters. One year in scrum, 10 years in project management. Yeah, project manager. Yes, five years, IT manager. Awesome, okay, starting my education about Scrum. Okay, three years. Lean early in the 90s, yes, respectful people. You know, we have in Germany uh, uh, big troubles. Uh, all these lean initiatives, they, they failed because what did they forget? Respectful people and continuous improvement. You know, that's, uh, we, are, we were <laughs> struggling a lot in Germany with that. Enterprise coach, eight years. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. So I, I, I know a little bit better who is in, who's in the audience right now. Um, by the way, we have, we have time for a Q and A at the end of the session. And if I, if you have a question where you say, okay, uh, Peter, uh, I lost you, please interrupt me. And if it's a little bit more. Um, you know, uh, 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 a question where we need to have a little discussion, maybe we can skip it to the or, or uh, schedule it at the end of the session. Would that be okay? That works. Some thumbs. 
um, okay, awesome, okay. So a, a question to you, maybe we can use the chat as well. How would you recognize good scrum? How would you recognize that your teams are doing good scrum? Anything. You type in the chat or, or speak up. Team members Regular. have it, like a stakeholders have it, yes. Value delivery, awesome. Mm -hmm. Delivering, yes. Self-organizing, yeah. Yeah. Hitting velocity, stable flow, empowered, taking the right decisions, yes. They have the decisions. Living up to agile values, oh, I like that. People want to join the team, awesome. Okay, great, yes. So in, in 2016, I, I visited Jeff in Boston. We, we did around 40 trainings in Germany and in, uh, in Europe together. And 2016, I went to Boston and um, Jeff in the training got to the flip chart and made this drawing, the mathematics of production. So from his experience, uh, as a, as a seasoned, let's say, scrum coach and CTO of 11 companies. So, and when they're consulting companies, um, they uh, gather together the, uh, the managers, the leadership, and, and they create a backlog, an overall backlog, what the teams are doing. And they find out that it's just 70% of the stuff that uh, that people are doing in the organization are really wanted by the organization. There are 30% which were not um, wanted by the organization, maybe through miscommunication, uh, maybe by not taking decisions. The, the number in the middle here um, features useful. Maybe you're familiar with that, the, the Standish Group, the chaos report, that it's only 36% of the features that are really relevant to the customer. 64% of the features are rarely or never used by the customer. And then what, what uh, Scrum Inc. observed in companies uh, is that people or companies were using or, or having very low process efficiency. So this is a lean metric. It's, uh, it's the value at a time for something divided, to the, uh, divided through the calendar time. So let's say if a team would need just one day uninterrupted to deliver something. And if the working system is through organizational debt, um, somehow that bad that they, maybe they, they can, they need five days to deliver something for, so they are interrupted, they have waiting times, they need specialists who are not available, they need somebody making a decision, maybe a manager. So let's say they don't use, they don't need one day, they need five days. So it's one day just activities for value delivery divided by five days calendar time. That would be a 20% process efficiency. So wherever Scrum Inc is coming in, they figure, they see, observe that the process efficiency of the teams or companies is they never have any seen any higher than 15%. So if we would multiply these numbers together, we would have uh, so 70% useful stuff, 36% useful for the customer with a process efficiency delivered by 15%. So we are using, using a potential of 3.7% to deliver something of value to a customer in a certain time. So what we wanna try with Scrum and we wanna try with Scrum at scale as well is that we look at the process efficiency and we try to figure out what are the what's the organizational debt how can we remove this organizational debt incrementally changing the way of working systems so it's that we not just have maybe 15 percent process efficiency let's assume we have 30 percent so that's apparently the role of the scrum master 
Hey, the, um, question, can I ask yeah. a quick question just to sure. keep up with you? I, um, can you explain a little more of the difference between doing anything useful and features that are useful to the customer? Um, no. Yeah, let's say, let's say um, the company is, is supporting uh, Windows 7 or Windows XP, you know, but, but not many users are, are, really, um, are really working with these systems or there is exchanging um, the operating system. So that would probably, that, that's sometimes a hard decision. Um, you know, to, to stop the Windows 7 support or to stop the support for older versions of, of a system. Features useful would mean Excel is a, is a very good example. The typical Excel user is using 3% of Excel. 97% of the features are not used by most of the people who are using Excel. That makes sense somehow? It does, thank you. I've answered your question. You did. Thanks. So what we are trying is that the, we are trying to measure the process efficiency. We try to increase the process efficiency on a company level. The product owners are of course responsible for finding out what the customer really needs. And then we get together the leadership as well to have an overall company prioritization so that we are not doing 30% of not useful stuff, maybe let's say 15%. I think we can never get rid of that. So if we multiply these numbers again, we have uh, a five-fold more um, potential use of the company to deliver something. So we wanna do this with Scrum and we wanna do this with Scrum at scale so that these numbers are increasing. Like you said, uh, we have a working product, the teams are delivering, the customer is happy, uh, we have a shorter time to market. Um, I think with the basics, so th these are Scrum basics. Uh, if this works for single teams, then we would think about um, scaling Scrum throughout the company. If this is not working for a single team, so if you're in an environment and you think about scaling Scrum and these numbers are not increasing, don't scale this. I don't know if you're familiar with a, uh, let's say, a, a basic paper, the basic concepts about Scrum from, from 1986. So I, uh, I pick this because I, um, I figure out, especially in Germany, we have some trouble with this. So Scrum is laid out in the Scrum guide. But the principles behind Scrum, uh, so that the organization can, th can thrive, um, are the uh, role model of Scrum we see in this paper from 1986. So John Dove here, uh, I met him two years ago, uh, handed Jeff over this paper, the new new product development game. He made the experience, uh, experience that two pro that one project, he, he tried one project twice. It didn't work. And then he used this paper, this concept, applied it and worked. So he gave 1993, he gave Jeff this paper and said, okay, um, why don't you try this? So Jeff made the experiences in 1983 in his first company uh, where he worked as a uh, uh, as a vice president for advanced engineering, and and they delivered pro they delivered um, the product quite differently, and then they used this. So in a in a good Scrum implementation, we see a certain kind of built-in instability where where teams can self-organize. If there is no built-in instability, probably teams won't self-organize. That is the problem if you if you introduce a heavy scaling framework with, with already decided processes. The problem is with these huge frameworks is that teams won't self-organize. So we need this kind of, of, of freedom so that, that their teams take over the responsibility. So build-in instability is a precondition for self-organizing teams. And that's true for one team and for several Scrum teams. We already know that we want to have a cross-functional team. That's why we have these overlapping development phases. 
um, that requires multi-learning, that requires I have to learn uh, how my job changes, I have to learn um, to work with people, I have to learn uh, new skills, how to deliver a uh, product. Um, then the, uh, the system is organized in a way that they teams that if there's something going wrong, that there's maybe a subtle control by management. If the control is too tight, we are ruining the self-organization of the teams. And point six in this paper is that we take these organizational, these learnings to the organization and we are adapting the organization based on these learnings. And again, that's a problem. Again, if you, if you take a huge scaling framework and you are not changing the organization sprint by sprint uh, based on the experiences you make, you probably lose a big part of the organization and a big part of the power of, of self-organization. So without these concepts, without these paper scrum in a scaled fashion, probably won't work. So what we're doing when we're changing systems, if we look at how systems or biological systems change, there is a, um, there is a phenomenon in evolutional biology, it's called punctuated equilibrium. If we look at the system, we see that's stable for a long time, but there are small changes that are happening constantly. So we might not see them, but they are happening. So, and this was a big, big relief for me. And I guess I needed 10 co-trainings with, with Jeff to really understand this because I always thought I had, that I needed all the answers to consult my companies. But if we see how systems change, we, or how evolution works, we always look for what's the next step to change the system, to, to make it better, to make a team better? What's the smallest step we need to take to make the team better? We are not looking for the big solutions. We are, we are looking for the next possible and the smallest step, and we take that step. And that's the way we can, how we can really change a system. It's not in scaling that we uh, say or decide from January 1st on the whole company will turn agile. That will probably fail. So if we, if we want to make the system change, we look for the, always for the next possible step. Um, I will share the, the, the PDF file. Uh, Leland, I will share the PDF with you so that everybody can, can look maybe this video. This is a talk Jeff gave at Google uh, mm -hmm. more than 10 years ago um, to understand this concept a little bit better. In that case, uh, the people at Google decided that everybody needs to have a better understanding of the architecture so that everybody can help better. So in the same approach is, uh, or this same principle is we are using to change an organization. In one training, um, Jeff took a detour uh, somebody asks something that's always the most interesting thing when Jeff is doing some detours and, and for, for, for me as a trainer makes it very easy when, when Jeff is, is, is saying something like this because uh, that creates a lot of focus. Saying that the most important thing in Scrum is that the Scrum Master is running a scientific experiment every day to figure out to how, how to make the team better. So again, we see the responsibility in this, uh, at the Scrum Masters to figure out these small steps, how we can change the company. If this is not working in a team, the Scrum Master is not taking over that responsibility, it won't probably work for the whole organization. So, and here's the experiment. If you want to improve the organization, hey, that is Peter, some, yes. Another question. <laughs> Sure. Uh, on that last slide, um, I hear, I see two, con what I think are conflicting thoughts at times within our organization. Sometimes there's this notion of the scrum master as the sort of the, you know, the, the brain 
the brain trust, you know, the person who's like solely responsible for making the team better. And then you also will hear the other mindset less common of, well, what about the team's responsibility for making themselves better? And it fits with self-organization. Um, can you comment on that? What, what, cause this, this statement by Jeff makes it sound a little bit like, well, the scrum master is the sort of, uh, the brains of the whole operation and he's pulling all the strings. Yeah, sure. Sure. That's a, that's a kind of hero here, right? So let's take yeah. over there. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. That is, uh, if, can we agree on that? The scrum master, he is a facilitator who makes it mm. possible for the team to yeah. do that. I think this is the point here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I, I was I was standing in the training and I was making notes and uh, 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 recording the talks. So to find out exactly this sentence brings it uh, to the point. So when I observe um, how we do this, not only in Scrum, but uh, in Scrum at scale as well, we come to very simple steps. And that's something I discussed with Jeff. So Jeff, what, what we're really doing here for one team or for several teams is always we are clarifying what we are shipping and we are prioritizing and we are testing, experimenting, is our prioritization right? And then Jeff mentioned, okay, now you should show the data that your prioritization is right. And we should show the data and we should measure and increase that we measure and increase the process efficiency and our throughput sometimes measured in velocity show data that it works. And like you said in the beginning, we see good scrum when the team is happy. So here we see this, this, this simple experiment. And if, if we don't have this data, um, please don't think about scaling. So when we start, we first start a stable reference model where one team, two teams, three teams to six teams are, are working properly. And when, so that they can deliver each sprint that we see these numbers are, are increasing. That's, that's the starting point in Scrum. How they wanna to work together, we will look at a little bit later, but that's the start first. Now, if we wanna scale the system, there are some, um, some principles important. If we, if we want to want to scale them, that they are, uh, that, that they're not uh, losing the productivity, we want to make sure that we have a kind of minimum viable bureaucracy. So only uh, the rules and processes that are, that are needed to coordinate the teams. And it means that the same principles are true for one team as a set of teams, as thousands of teams that are working together. We call uh, this principle, we call this a, a kind of scale-free architecture. So we know this from, from chip design, um, uh, from Intel. If, if we see at the number of transistors on, 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 the, on the chip, um, the architecture should make sure that uh, the communication works properly. So that means that Scrum at scale is using uh, a object-oriented design, which makes the scale-free architecture work, which means Scrum at scale consists of certain components which are interacting with each other. And here we see, um, we see the model. The product owners, the red circle, are working together. In a company, we should figure out what's the strategic vision of the company. Maybe you are in a context as well, you figure out, okay, teams are working great, but this, the company is really not working properly. So if, if we can't fix that, uh, the teams won't improve. So the product owners are collaborating on the strategic vision of the company. Um, they are collaborating on an overall company backlog prioritization. They are collaborating that the teams have their backlogs. So they, they know what, is, what has to be done. 
the product owners are collaborating when do we want to release our stuff the product owners make sure that we get the feedback to the products and we incorporate this feedback and this information flows back to the teams and back again to the strategic vision and back again through uh, back to the backlog prioritization so this is where the product owners are collaborating these are components with inputs and outputs the strategic vision delivers an orientation for the backlog prioritization that means we need some information from the product and release feedback component. We need some data from the teams. So these are the inputs. In the middle here, you see um, a, a component we call the executive matter scrum. This is an overall prioritization for the company. That's, it's on an executive level. It could be a team. When I'm doing Scrum coaching um, and I'm working with board members, I try to form a team of board members um, that always works better for me. It, but it could be an event as well, maybe uh, once a month in, uh, for each company where they come together and agree on the, uh, have a look at the strategic vision and agree on the backup prioritization. So that's the product side, that's the what of the company. So it's the same if I'm working with one team or if I'm working with several teams, because when I'm working with one Scrum team, I need to have the connection to the company as well. On the left side, you see what the Scrum Masters are doing. So the Scrum Masters are helping that the teams are working so that they could work, that they are self-organizing. The Scrum Masters, are facilitating the continuous improvement. We talked about this. The Scrum Masters are helping that the teams can coordinate. Uh, the Scrum Masters help that the teams can deliver. The Scrum Masters facilitate that the teams get the right feedback to the product, to the technical aspects. Are they, are they delivering the product in the right way? This information back again flows back to the teams. So this is where the Scrum Masters are responsible for. In, in the middle, we see a component that's called an executive action team. So we talk about a little bit about this, this later. It's, it's a team, it's a management team that is responsible that this agile bubble is working, that the organization is developing, that impediments are being resolved. So what teams cannot resolve by themselves the executive action team will take care of. In the middle, we see a component metrics and transparency. So what kind of metrics are important for steering the company? For the product owners is probably there are product related metrics for the Scrum Master Cycle here, it's more about the velocity data, it's about the team happiness, it's about throughput or uh, cycle times. So these components are work with each other. And the interesting thing is, if we uh, look at the context of the company, we look at the state of the components, how they're working for the company, and then we are looking for the next step where we can improve the system. So let's start with the executive action team. So that's the first step when we think about scaling. This is the support of the management. So we figure out, okay, who is in this executive action team? It's typically, it's somebody from, um, somebody who is politically empowered to change the company. Uh, sometimes in smaller companies, it might be the CEO, might be the product owner of the executive action team. That could be possible. Um, sometimes if the organization is bigger, it's a, it's, it's a vice president, but somebody who's powerful can change the organization. So this component has the goal of figuring out what's our transformation stra strategy. They are looking at metrics. Uh, they are um, looking at the impediments the teams have, and they are establishing this agile bubble and removing impediments that are disturbing this agile bubble. 
I, I think there is some things in the chat. Maybe I should have a look at that. Okay, somebody is writing here. Okay, is, it, is there any question so far I, I should answer right now? I, I think you just got one about for executives being new to Scrum, how do you advise setting up events to slowly introduce them? Well, uh, typically executives are, are are pretty nervous when we when we talk about Scrum, right? Uh, if I'm talking to executive and say, okay, we are changing the way of working, the teams are changing the way of working, and uh, that we that will create a a kind of instability and insecurity. Uh, executives sometimes get very nervous, so we say to them, okay, let's start with a pilot in a pilot and then slowly roll out this pilot and these pilots should work and the people should be happy and engaged and that we create more speed if we disrupt the whole company at once from the, from the start. Awesome. So this is if, if we look, I don't know if you're familiar with the state of Agile with the version one report where we see uh, the biggest challenges and the biggest challenges in adopting Scrum. And it's very often it's uh, the organizational culture and it's the management support. This framework, the management support is built in in this, exec in this executive action team. So if we don't get the support of the executives and they don't agree forming this team I would probably not support an agile transformation. Hey, Peter, Todd here again. Somebody else is going to ask questions. You're going to get tired of me asking them. But um, this piece is really interesting to me. Um, we've experimented a little with Scrum at Scale, uh, my company, um, but not all the way up to the executive. We don't have this executive action team. And, and there is definitely, um, there's sort of from the top levels of the organization, you're having a bit of a safe for traditional project management type approaches. So some collisions there between agile and something less agile like safe. Um, and I just had, I've had this, I had this question kind of in my mind that could this, could I take a component of this like this executive action team? Um, could it be an engine maybe to, to, to drive change even if you have some really broken pieces that big pieces that you're dealing with in your org? Um, do, do you think this piece of the of the Scrum at Scale meta framework could could be used alone? The interesting thing for me is um, that it doesn't matter how you fill this component. So we just say this component has inputs and and, and outputs. It has a goal. On this slide, you see the inputs for the executive action team, and you see the outputs. Yeah. And how you fulfill this? It's kind of that black box. How you fulfill this, it doesn't matter. So one way could be that, um, that maybe there is another team that is somehow working as a kind of executive action team. And somehow you can um, uh, uh, get some support from, from management as a stakeholder. That you make impediments visible to the delivery or to the agile way of working. And that could be a start as well. Do you find that having like a specific role for executives, because I think a lot of times the way it plays out is Scrum is happening at the, t at the team level, development team level, and the executives are just kind of like looking down being like, mm, I don't know about this. Do you feel like giving them a role um, increases the likelihood that you'll get buy-in and that they'll kind of come around and, and like understand the principles or do they have to kind of already be bought into it in order to be part of the executive action team? Well, well, typically when, when, when we start an agile transformation, um, people get very curious when it's really working. So if, if, if the, uh, if the metrics are increasing, then people see, okay, this system is working. I want to learn more about this. If, uh, if, it's, if you can't show that's really working, uh, executives are not really interested in, in participating. 
the other part is when we when we change a system to Scrum or an agile way of working, we um, we give the people in these we give the teams the decision rights. So we change decision rights. So we take some power away from managers. And that question is, okay, if this is working and 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 I'm losing this power right now, what's my role here? And and this is powerful, uh, having them either in the executive action team or in an executive meta scrum. And uh, for some people, it's a relief because some people become managers because they are very long in the company. Is that right? So they may be, may be responsible for a product and now they are, uh, uh, they are responsible for leading people, but that's actually not their thing. Now they decide, okay, they have, and managers have to decide, am I interested in the product? And I become a product owner. Am I interested in the process? I may be becoming a scrum master. Am I interested in, 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 this, in the people system? Then maybe I step out and I'm, I'm, a, uh, I, I'm a person in agile leadership who's, who's taking care that the system is working. So uh, it, it's nobody there that, who has responsibility for the product and for the involvement of, of for the uh, evolving of the system. Doesn't make sense somehow? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, it, it always we should we should show that it's working. That's uh, something I learned from Jeff. Uh, Jeff is actually not the uh, uh, you know he is not, he has not a, a, a coaching training at, at traditional. But what Jeff is asking if if some managers introduce a, a really um, let's say broken system, Jeff would always ask first, how does it work for you? Prove to me that it works. So if you, but if you implement this traditional system, it doesn't work. So then they figure out, okay, it's not working for them. And then they have to prove that it works again. And then they are listening. Uh, I'm always surprised when I'm, when I'm doing, um, uh, when, I, when I coach board members of the company, um, how they are leading the company. So, what we do is we set them up as a scrum team and they figure out how they can be more effective and, and how, can, how can they delegate some power to other people so that the decisions are made very, a lot faster. And that will speed up delivery. And at that moment, people think, okay, it's very transparent, it works. Um, how can I help next? Maybe this is, um, uh, we have in, in SAFE, there are some uh, skate agile framework. There are some, uh, some positions for managers, but there is not this um, specific role for organizational development. And the executive action team is taking care of this organizational development. If you, if you think back, um, if you think about the new, new product development game and the six concepts, organizational transfer of learning, this is the component who's taking care of that. It might be that uh, they are creating something kind of agile practice team where the scrum masters gather together and these agile practice teams uh, or this team helps the executive action team in developing um, the company. But they're taking care of this. They're accountable for this. So when we look at, the, um, at, at, a, at a system, we look at the components and we assess the components. So very typically, um, we don't have the management support. So in, in that moment, it's probably the first thing we want to do. So uh, what we do in a, in a, in a Scrum and Scale training or something you can, you can do as well is you look at all the components, you see, okay, um, how are the components working? And then you figure out, okay, where would it make sense to change the system again? I have to look, I, I need to, I think I have to look at the chat here. Oh, so many questions. Um, is it okay if I move to the, through the slides and we, um, we finish them? Uh, we are right at the end and then we have some time for these questions. Would that be okay? 
Okay, Annie, you're nodding. Annie, you are the only person I'm seeing right now. So let's do that. So what we do is we think we assess all these components and we think about, okay, how important are they for us? So let's say in, in this example here, let's say we have a lot of problems with the delivery. Uh, in this case, that's an old slide, it says deployment. Let's say it's uh, uh, um, the product is really crappy and, and customers are running away. So then probably it would be uh, strategically very important to improve this component if it's not really working well. So what we look here is uh, how good are the, pro the components implemented right now? The green is the good thing. The, uh, the purple here is, is in a bad way. And on the y-axis, you see how strategically important are they next. So and we look at each component, we assess it, and then we figure out in this example here, we see, okay, we probably should start with the executive action team first. So and this is this is how it would probably look like if we if we transform a company to Scrum. We first under, try to understand what's the context of the company. Where do we want to go? Then we prioritize. Where could we start? In in the good old example of Jeff, 1983, it was the worst business unit. If you change anything there, it it doesn't really matter. So where would you start? Where is your pilot? Where would you start implementing Scrum? Who needs to be involved from senior leadership? So what kind of support do we need? So that's number three here. Then who do we need in, uh, for the executive meta Scrum? So what kind of decisions have to be made? Then we would start uh, one team or several teams. I, I always, uh, I, I would never, recommend starting with more than nine teams. Typically we start with three to six teams and when the teams deliver, so we form the teams, we create the backlog, we do startups or launches. Um, when the teams are able to deliver every sprint, then we think about, okay, where can we expand the system next? So these steps from five to nine, we repeat again and again and again until the whole organization is, is working in that fashion. So it's always, where are we now? What's our biggest problem that we need to solve? What's the product? Who should, which teams do we need? Can the teams deliver? Are the teams improving? Where do we expand the model next? So these are some questions where we figure out, okay, um, so if speed of delivery is very important, we would probably improve the, the continuous improvement component and the team level process. If innovation is very important, we would probably look at the strategic vision and at the feedback component. If, uh, if what's a driving framework for becoming agile, if we need to be very fast, okay, we would probably first start with the team level process and with the executive action team and make sure that organizational impediments are resolved. So these questions could guide you what could be the most important component next. So then you take these components, you look, okay, based on our context, what's the most important component, how good it is right now, and where should we start? And then we create a change backlog. We look at the component and we try to improve this component. Good example, as you probably know, that is a Toyota Kata. So that's that's very easy. That's I, for me, from my experience, is one of the easiest ways to improve systems because we can uh, we can facilitate an agreement within team to figure out what's the target condition. Let's say we want a functioning executive action team. Um, and we can help the team step by step to create a next experiment and say uh, um, we give it a time frame. 
we evaluate the experiment and then we can uh, go from there. So that's an easy way to, um, to find these incremental steps and have the team make a decision, take the step and assess it. So, and that could be um, right at the end, that could be one example. We see here four Scrum teams. Um, so that's a more easy example. We see four Scrum teams, left and right side are the same. So the Scrum teams, they all have a Scrum master. They gather together in, in a scaling, um, uh, technique we call a scrum of scrums. So that's a release team. This team is responsible or accountable for the releasing of the product or for the integration of the product. This team has a scrum of scrums master. If four teams are not enough, maybe in this, is this example, we have 16 teams. They gather together in, in four scrum of scrums and these four scrum of scrums are building a scrum of scrum of scrums uh, we encourage every company to find their own names for that, uh, for that constellation. On the right side, you see the product owner perspective. So we see a product owner for each team. Uh, the product owners are prioritizing maybe more on a user story level. Um, then we have a kind of chief product owner for this Scrum of Scrums. Uh, maybe uh, the chief product owner is uh, prioritizing on a higher level. Uh, they have the same Scrum or Scrum's master. And in that case, if we scale up the product owner role, we have a kind of chief, chief product owner. And again, we encourage you to find your own names. And uh, in the middle, we have the executive action team, which is responsible for the organizational development and that this construction works. And we have the executive meta scrum. So we have a kind of product owner for the whole organization. So that could be an application of Scrum at scale. Uh, the practical uh, um, scaling uh, method here is, is, is a Scrum of Scrums, or you could use a Nexus framework. I see that you have in November, you have a, you have a talk about Nexus. So maybe ne a Nexus is an instance of Scrum at scale. So we have a couple of questions. Where should I start? Oh my God, so many questions. Maybe, maybe, I should, maybe I should start with the last one and then we work us through to the older ones. That we okay? That works. Okay, November, you, uh, Leland, you have a November talk about Nexus, is that correct? Actually, it's January. It's January, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, Chief, Chief, Chief Prodona, C3PO, yes, again, Please find your own names, um, or if you want to call three C three people, that's fine as well. So there's a uh, there's a question from Sherry, right? Sherry, can you can you ask the question right away? I may, maybe I'm uh, maybe we are faster. We have a short conversation. Assess your ex executive action team. That's, uh, you asked me, do you, how do you find strategic importance? Sherry, have I, have I already answered your question or should we talk about this? Sherry, are you there? It's like Sherry was mainly just summarizing work, like That's, yeah. things as you- okay. She's just writing what you already said. Okay. You were asking, define strategic importance. So if you, if you don't change uh, the component, what would be the consequences? That would be a kind of strategic importance. Yeah, how to how to determine where you plot the items? That's uh, that's a great question. Um, I think we were here. So let's say I really have a problem uh, if my deployment or delivery component is not working. Maybe it's. Um, Maybe I have, my product has a lot of defects. 
So if I don't improve that, the, the company will be ruined. Then my strategic importance will be on level five. If I would say, well, you know what? It's, uh, it's absolutely working. We have no problems with that. Uh, it's stable and probably um, strategically important is it right now in the moment, uh, not very much. If you would say, okay, um, you know, um, you know, the, the management is, is um, uh, if we don't have the buy-in of the management, let's say, uh, let's say your company had uh, some recent or uh, reorganization initiatives and uh, people are really um, annoyed by all these initiatives because um, the management is imposing changes but is not supporting, then probably it's strategically very important that these people, uh, that these people help. And that's important for the motivation. So maybe then um, it, it's very important on the y-axis. Um, if you say, you know, we are, we are really an agile company. If I have a problem, management is helping me. Management is helping on coaching the teams. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty okay. Then, then maybe that's not your biggest problem. Have I answered your question, Sherry? Awesome, awesome, thanks. So Kamal, you have a question. What's the, what is the approach or method of rolling out decisions from the leadership teams to the scrum teams while preserving the team self-organization? Okay. Well, probably um, well, when, when I give the team uh, the freedom to form a scrum team, I will give the decision right, certain decision rights to the product owner. So dear product owner, you are responsible for the product. You make this, these decisions, right? And then the scrum team is starting and then suddenly management will say, no, 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 product owner. Uh, uh, maybe these decisions, there's something we want to decide for ourselves. And then we are in, in a negotiation learning curve. So as a scrum master, we want to facilitate a discussion that the product owners have as much freedom as possible. And maybe uh, you figure out that the strategic vision component is not really working because the product owner is making weird decisions from a uh, leadership perspective. So then we figure out that we should improve this um, strategic vision component. It might be that we uh, implement, that we, um, we talk about this in the Matter Scrum event, it might be that we implement a method, something like a V2 mom from uh, Salesforce. Uh, that's a way how, um, um, they communicate their vision to the teams and this uh, flows down to the teams and flows up back to the management again. So this is a V2 mum from Salesforce might be a specific implementation, how we can improve their strategic vision. Okay, um, Peter, I think we're right at time here. So I wanna respect the time box as well. So I um, wanna thank you for, uh, for doing this. This was great. I wrote myself a few notes myself of things to look into a little further. Sure. Yeah, as well. you know what? We, we have several questions here. Um, okay. If, 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 if you... Um, if you want to have a conversation, something, a, a Zoom call, or uh, if you want to write me an email, or, or please contact me on LinkedIn, um, and we find some time that maybe I can give you some hints or some more materials. Uh, there are on the, uh, let me write this down, scrumatscale.com. On this website, there are a lot of examples and case studies. Um, I have trainer colleagues in the US and in Europe. Uh, they are offering online trainings. Um, but if you have a question, why don't you write me uh, at LinkedIn and I can maybe answer your question. So that's uh, all we have a conversation. Okay. Sounds great. <clears throat>
Awesome. It's a, wow, that was a pretty short hour here. It, it goes sure quick, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, again, this is, I think the most, the most important thing here is it, Scrum at Scale is the easiest way how you can assess where your company is right now and how you, how you can find the next spot where you can improve the system. So it's not a, a scaling framework like save less uh, um, or Nexus. These might be um, instances of Scrum at Scale. Scrum at Scale is just this meta framework. Okay. Well, great. All right. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for your time, everybody. Yeah. All right. So you'll get me the PDFs, and I'll, I'll uh, for everyone else out there on the meetup page in the comments, I'll post a link to the PDFs when, when Peter sends them to me, along with this video. Um, I, you had also mentioned Toyota Kata. I love the Toyota Kata. It's probably one of my heavy used items. So I'll post something also in there around Toyota Kata, like a little, the Toyota Kata cards that helps you when you go through the questions and you can flip it over and talk, walks you through the process. So I'll, I'll include all of that into the, into the uh, meetup comments area for everyone. Awesome. Thanks Leland for organizing this. Yeah, it was fun. So. Okay. Thank I, you guys. Uh, yeah, okay. thanks a lot. Uh, Leland, do we have to leave this room right now? Are you kicking us out? No, I'm gonna stop recording at least.